Hey guys, so today we're going to talk about my favorite contemporary technique, which is singing and playing. And I've already made the performer video, so we're going to talk about composers today. I'll link the performer video in the cards and in the description, obviously. Go check that out if you're interested in that. But I wanted to talk about this one in particular just because there are so many variables with this particular technique. It becomes very difficult to navigate if you don't have an idea of what you can do and what you can't do. So, the first variable, which is obviously the biggest one, is vocal range. A lot of people will write for a particular performer, which you know I'm a big proponent of, but with this particular technique, it becomes very, very difficult to do that. Someone like me, who has an incredibly low voice, will get pieces that are written in a very awkward range for a lot of people. If you have a very low voice, if you're a baritone or a bass, you can't necessarily sing the higher pitches, and if you have a higher voice, like even a mezzo-soprano or a soprano, you can't sing the lower pitches. So writing some for someone like me, it makes it harder just because our voices are weird. That being said, if you allow for octave displacement, so allow the person who's playing the piece to transpose it lower or higher based on their voice, then you remove some of the limitations. I understand that changes the interaction of the voice and the flute, and that is something you do have to keep in mind. If you're writing things where the octave displacement is going to ruin the texture of the piece, then you kind of have to write it with a voice type in the description. Um, I've seen pieces that were written for flute and soprano voice, or flute and tenor voice. So it is something that you can do, but it, just remember that it limits who can play it. What I've also seen is two different parts, one for a higher voice and one for a lower voice. What I discovered, though, is because my voice is right in the middle, sometimes that doesn't even cover everyone. Cristiano Melli, who is a 52 Weeks composer who wrote Something Else I Saw in the Water, which I performed in that project, wrote two different parts, which if we hadn't transposed it down a fourth into alto flute, it would have been very, very difficult for me to play just because the higher part was too high for me and the lower part was too low for me. By changing the flute, we brought the higher part down into my range and we got really lucky that it worked really well, but that was something that I hadn't even thought of when I picked that piece. When I started to work on it, I realized I couldn't hit the high notes with the consistency I needed to create the texture that he needed. And luckily, there was an option that made it easier, but that's something that composers should also keep in mind in the creation of the piece, is that there are certain performers that are going to be cut out of your music just because vocal ranges are personal. Once you have the vocal range set, you have to figure out where the player is going to find these pitches. It's very difficult to sing in harmony with the flute when you have no reference or you're finding a pitch out of midair. The same way in vocal music you have to give the singer reference pitches or at least a starting point to go off of, you really do need to give the flutist. We're still singers in this particular situation and most of us don't have perfect pitch so it makes it very very hard. If you only work with flutists with perfect pitch you can ignore this next segment but most of us don't so... I found that either starting in unison which is obviously the easiest option or bringing the voice in on the previous flute pitch, or even just giving space enough that the flutist can find the pitch and then move is the easiest thing. A lot of these pieces are solo flute pieces, so it's not like you can give a reference note on the piano or something like that. So you do have to find creative ways to give the flutist their pitch. Um, personally, if I get a piece that has no reference pitches in it, I am either going to have to memorize the feeling of the interval, which I guess is how singers learn how to do things, but considering that flutists aren't generally trained singers, you're going to be working with someone who isn't as comfortable finding pitches out of midair or even remembering pitches from practice. Obviously that's something we work on and everything like that, but I think ideally Finding a way to meld the voice into the flute and then expand from there is easier just because we're not trained singers most of the time. 
If you're working with a trained singer, again, you can ignore this advice. But again, remembering that these pieces are meant to be played by more than just the premier artist, maybe it's something to think about. The next thing is the texture between the flute and the voice. Do you want more flute than voice? Do you want more voice than flute? Do you want the voice to sneak into the texture and then build away? Like you really do have to give almost dynamic ranges for both voices in the situation. Uh, Fernie Howe actually did this really well, and I know some of you are looking at me like Fernie Howe had good notation. Fernie Howe has an excellent notation. You just have to know how to read it. <laughs> um, there's a line in Cassandra where you're singing in unison with the flute, but the voice line has to grow while the flute line decrescendos. And it's very, very clear. There's separate dynamics for the separate voices. And while it's difficult to pull off, you at least know exactly what he wants. It's something to think about when you're writing for this technique is which line do I want more present? Do I want them 100% equal? Do I want the voices to interchange? Which one's more important? Or do I want them to be completely unified? Also keep in mind that if you're playing in unison with your voice, there will be some crunch. It is almost impossible to have true unison. You can do octaves okay just because they're wider and they're a little bit easier to tune, but true unison is very, very difficult. It'll have some microtonal texture just because it's so hard to tune your voice and the flute while doing all of this. And the final thing, that I personally prefer is the notation style. Personally, as someone who does this a lot and as someone who is more comfortable reading flute lines than vocal lines and kind of fixing my voice based on the flute line rather than just finding the pitches, I prefer to see the flute line and the vocal line together with either n n note head changes or stem indications of which one's which. I know it makes it harder to engrave, but because of the way that I read these lines and I read them in relation to each other, I want to see them in relation to each other rather than having to find two completely separate lines and basically read it like piano music. Granted, I was a piano player for a very long time, so I can do it. And there are a lot of flutists who prefer it because they think about the lines separately. It's something that you have to make a decision on and you have to be very clear with, but it's also something that like, if someone came to me and went, hey, I'm writing for flute and voice for you, what do you want me to do? I would say, put them in the same line. The exception to that rule is actually the piece that I mentioned before, which was Something Else I Saw in the Water by Cristiano Melli. That piece basically had to have the vocal line and the flute line separate just because they were so close to each other the whole time that had they been in the same staff, it would have been almost impossible to read. So that's a call on the composer's part. Legibility is definitely more important than my preference in that particular situation and in any situation in general. but. For me and the way that I learn music, I prefer to have them in the same line rather than in two separate staves. But again, that's something that you have to come up with yourself and it's something that you have to be very clear about which one's the vocal line, where's the vocal line going, which one's the flute line, where's the flute line going, and how do I notate that? So at the end of this video, a drill started going and I tried to time my segments in the middle of the drill but if you hear any noise in the background I apologize it's just kind of part of this apartment life apparently um, I hope this video was helpful if you guys have a technique that you want me to cover either for composers or performers please let me know as always if you like this video give it a like if you're new here subscribe if you want to support me more check out my patreon and I will see you guys next week